me, let us go into the house of the Lord. It's, it's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. It's a beautiful day. Sister Aiken, you know what? Any day for us is beautiful. You know why that is? I don't know how you, I don't know how it works with you, but when they, when they, when they, when they uh, doctor looked at me and he told me, he said, I told you, I told you we were going to get it. I told you we were going to get it. Then he, uh, he searched my eyes. <laughs> because, see, he felt like he, he spoke the kiss of death to me. And I was supposed to just, right? And I was supposed to whine and cry. And I said, oh my God, I didn't know what was going to happen to me. And he looked. Didn't move a muscle. And you know what? When I come, when I got home, what do you think the first thing I did? I got on my knees and I lifted up my hands and praised God. Any day, any day is a good day for me. Yeah? God brought me through that. So we thank God for this morning. This ticker. It's still ticking. Huh? Whoa! People are still dying of COVID. People are still being infected by COVID. But guess what? At 74 years old, I'm still kicking. Praise God. Hallelujah. We serve an awesome God. But maybe just share a word from the word with you this morning. Isaiah 53. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been disclosed? For you grew up before him like a tender plant and like a root on a dry ground. He has no form of comeliness that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected and forsaken by men, a man of sorrows and pains and acquainted with grief and sickness and like one for whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we did not appreciate his worth for having any esteem for him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows and pains. Yet we considered him stricken, smitten, and afflicted by God. He was wounded for our transgressions, he was bruised for our guilt and iniquities. The chastisement and well-being fell upon him, and with the stripes we are healed and made whole. All we like sheep have gone astray, we have turned every one of us to his own way, and the Lord has made to light upon him the guilt and the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, he was afflicted, he was submissive and opened on his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened on his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who among them considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people to whom the stroke was due? And they assigned him a grave with the wicked and with the rich rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to bruise him. He was put him to grief and made him sick. When you and he make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days, and the will and pleasure of the Lord shall pass in his hand. He shall see of the travail of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge of himself shall my righteous one, my servant, justify many and make many righteous. For he shall bear the iniquities and the guilt. Therefore will I divide him in portion with the great, and he shall divide his poor with the mighty, because he poured out his life unto death, and be regarded as a criminal and be numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many, and 
I make the intercession for the transgressions. Father, you did all that to your son because you loved us so. And we are so grateful, we are so thankful that this morning that we can come and we can celebrate the victory of the cross. Father God, we might be few in number, but that doesn't change who you are. You're still the same yesterday, today, and forever. You're still a great and awesome God. You're still the mighty God. You're still the everlasting God. You're still amazing. You're so awesomely wonderful. And Almighty oh God, we, we thank you for this moment and we commit it to you and we ask, Almighty oh God, that everything that would be done at this time, it would be done because of what your Holy Spirit, dear God, has dictated you to us to do. And so, Lord God, at the end of this moment, we will fail not to give you the honor, glory, and praise, dear God, because we will say, oh, how good it is to be in the presence of the Lord, Almighty oh God. And we give thanks and we give honor and glory to you in that name that's above every other name, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen.
know who Jesus is. And one thing remains. His love never fails. Never gives up. And never runs out on me.
We pray the children who will be returning to school this morning. Come for our children. Come for our children, Father God. They are our seeds, Father God. They are to grow, Father God, in your name, in your word, Father God. Allow our children to be a beacon of light among their peers, Lord Jesus. They will never be ordinary. People will know the difference in them, and people will want to be like them, Lord Jesus. Be with our children. Father God, we pray for the shuttings. Those, Father God, who are homeless this morning. Those, Father God, who are friendless this morning. Those, Father God, who are fatherless this morning. Whisper a word in their ears this morning. Whisper a word in their ears this morning, Father God. I pray that you go into the prisons this morning. Someone that needs you, Lord Jesus. Go into the prisons this morning, Father God. Lord Jesus, we pray for the prisons. Uh, you know, this is not 
made up prayer. This is a prayer from the heart. Oh. We got to be, we got to be, we got to be prayed up. We got to be prayed up because these lights got to stay on. And like my sister always says, we open for business. Well, how are we going to be open for business if we don't take time to pray?
we don't have enough of a, of a vocabulary to thank you for that perfect sacrifice that Jesus Christ himself made. And you said, as often as you do this, Remember that sacrifice. Some churches are still shadow. But you, you allowed us to be here to celebrate this moment together as God's family. So, oh God, we commit this sacred moment to you that your Holy Spirit will speak the hearts and make us realize what an awesome privilege this is. In Jesus' name we thank you. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 11 verse 23 says, for I received from the Lord himself that which I passed on to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was delivered up and while his betrayal was in progress to pray. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Similarly, when supper was ended, he took the cup also, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink to call me to remembrance. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are representing and signifying and proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in a way that is unworthy will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Let a man examine himself and so should he eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discriminating and recognizing with due appreciation that body eats and drinks a sentence upon himself. That is the reason many of you are weak and sickly and quite enough of you have fallen into the sleep of death. For if we certainly examine ourselves we should not be judged and penalty decree. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined and chastened so that we may not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you gather together to eat, wait for one another. If anyone is hungry, let him eat at home, lest you come together to bring judgment on yourselves. About the other matters, I will give you directions. And now I invite you to stand, please. For I receive from the Lord Himself that which I passed on to you. That the Lord Jesus on the night when he was treacherously delivered up and while his betrayal was in progress, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this to call me to remembrance. Let us eat.
Similarly, when supper was ended, he took the cup also, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink to call me to remembrance. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are representing and signifying and proclaiming the fact of the Lord's death until he comes. Let us drink.
we know that in times like these, Father God, it's not always easy to do so. But thank God, we, we, we are glad that you bless us, that we can come into your house and we can bless you. Lord, my God, with the gifts that we give to you. So Lord, we take the gifts that we give to you and we pray your blessing. And Father God, use it, dear God, to give other glory and praise to your name. Lord, my God, in Jesus' precious name. I saw a man and a little boy walk, walk in the sanctuary and I said, was that, is that, wait a minute, wait a minute, am I, am I seeing right? Is that Chesley I'm seeing? Yes, and he took the mask off and it was Chesley. What? Chesley. Brother, glad to have you. Yes, I mean I come by your house every once in a while but to fellowship with you in church, we haven't done that long time. So, Chesley and his family were once members of my residual, but thank God, brother, you chose to come in and check in on us and see how we're doing. Praise the Lord for you. At this time, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. And we're on the theme of love once more. God has set certain standards for us to follow. And when God gave a command, he looks for us to follow them. And we can't make any excuses why we didn't. So 1 John chapter 3, and I would invite you to stand please as we read from verse 1 to verse 18. Beloved, I am now writing to you this second letter. In them I have stood up your unsullied mind by way of remembrance that you should recall the traditions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord and Savior to your apostles. To begin with, you must know and understand this, that scoffers, oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, I'm sorry. See what quality of love the Father has given, given us that we should we should be named and called and counted the children of God. And so we are. The reason that the world does not know us is that it does not know Him. Beloved, we are now God's children. It is not yet disclosed what we shall be, but we know that when He comes and is manifested, we shall resemble and be like Him, for we shall see Him just as He and everyone who has this hope in him cleanses himself just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. For sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in visible form and became man to take away sins. And in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him deliberately knowing and habitually commits sin. No one who sins has either seen or known him. Boys, let no one deceive and lead you astray. He who practices righteousness Consistently conscientious is righteous even as he is righteous. He who commits sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The reason the Son of God was made manifest was to undo the works of the devil. 
No one born of God practices sin or God's nature abides for God's nature abides in him. By this it is made clear who take their need from God and are his children and who take their need from the devil and are his children. No one who does not practice righteousness is of God. Neither is anyone who does not love his brother. For this is the message which you have heard from the first that we should love one another. And not by Cain, who took and got his motivation from the evil one and slew his brother. And why did he slay him? Because his deeds were wicked and malicious and his brothers were righteous. Do not be surprised and wonder, brethren, that the world detests and pursues you with hatred. We know that we have passed over out of death into life by the fact that we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in spiritual death. Anyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding within him. By this we come to know, to recognize, to perceive, to understand the love that he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother and fellow believer in need, closes his heart of compassion against him, how can the love of God live and remain in him? Little children let us love, not love in theory or in speech but in deed and truth. And I'd like to go back to what it says we have. Verse 14 says, We have passed over out of death into life by the fact that we love the brethren. You may be seen. Okay. So, but it also says that because Jesus Christ gave his life for us, the kind of love that we ought to demonstrate one to another is that we have to be willing to lay down our lives for the brethren. So how you know? How you know we love? How you know we love each other? How we know that we pass from death to life? You know we, we born again into the family of God because we love one another. When our brother or sister is in the predicament, what do we do? We come to the aid and we come to the rescue because of the love of Christ within us. And God said, you can't love me if you don't love your brother or sister. Hallelujah. Oh, I love God with all my heart. And then the next thing you know, you talking bad about brother so and so. And sister so and so, hmm? is that the love of Christ? No, that's not the love of Christ. It says, you can shout all you want, you can shout from the rooftops, you can shout from the mountaintops, if you want to, but if you have no love for your, for, for your brother, you can't love me. There's no, there's no such thing as a super Christian that, oh, you know, here it is, I love God, I'm serving God, and I'm doing all these things for God, but yet and you look down on your brother, you look down on your sister, and they, sometimes they, they in need. And you look beyond them. Because you feel like, wow, you know, if, if, if I give this brother so and so, or sister, this sister, if I come to their aid and rescue, maybe they have more than me. We have a problem in the body of Christ with envy. See? Cain had a problem with envy. They were from the same household, seed of the same mother and daddy, 
and yet envy caused our brother to kill his brother because they went before God and they offered sacrifices and God refused the sacrifice the king offered and God accepted Abel's sacrifice. Envy is like a poison in the body of Christ. Brother so and so, sister so and so, she got, she got, she got this anointing of God upon her. And instead of saying, wow, brother so and so, sister so and so, I thank God for you. I thank God for how you let God use you. You know, I, I, I got you prayed up, brother. I got you prayed up, sister. Did Cain know the law of sacrifices? Yes, he did know. How did he know? Because what was the first thing that God did with Adam and Eve said? He killed an animal. And he covered Adam and Eve with, this, with, the, with the skin of an animal. And that was teaching them sacrifice. And in those days, they didn't have the Bible like we did today. So a lot of traditions were passed down. So how could one brother know and the other one not know? Of course he did. But he chose to offer what he felt like he should do. And that was dis disrespectful and dishonoring to God. God could have done to Cain like he did some of those priests in the Old Testament, you know, when they went into the Holy of Holies and they weren't right before God. God would strike them down. And when they went into the Holy of Holies, they had a tire rope around them so that if they weren't right before God, when God struck them down, they didn't put the rope and pull them out, put their bodies out because God wasn't playing that. So he knew. And so often, we give to God what's not pleasing to Him. Because we think we're so righteous that we could offer anything before God and God has to accept it. And God has given us a lesson right here in this book and saying, no, no. When I want you to please me, I can't. I got, I got it all written down how you should approach me. But then God didn't treat Cain like he did the high, the high priest when they, when, they were, when they were not right before him. He gave him a chance. But did Cain accept it? No, he didn't accept it. Because envy Envy is a terrible sin. And instead of offering what God told him, he got up and shed his brother's blood. And when God said, your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground, he said, well, I'm my brother's keeper. Saints of God, we are our brothers and sisters keepers. And God said, the same way that Jesus Christ offered up himself as a sacrifice for your redemption, you ought to also be willing to offer up yourselves one for another. You ought to be willing to lay down your life one for another. Don't come to me and tell me how much you love me, but you, 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 can't, you can't be willing to lay down your life for your brother or sister. No, that's not loving me. Since of God, we can't take this thing too lightly. Hmm? I have 
have to be willing to give up my life for you. And that should be your expectation of me. And that should be your expectations of one another. But look at this. When Jesus went to the cross, they jammed a crown of thorns in his head. And they used these spikes to nail his hands to the cross and his feet. You know how painful that had to be? And it's not something that he had to do. He did it because of unconditional love. There's a song says that Jesus could have called 10,000 angels, but he chose to die alone. He did say, I could call a legion of angels if I wanted to. But he chose to endure the agony and the anguish of the cross because of love. And he's saying, you ought to be willing to do the same thing for each other. And maybe that's why some Christians don't like to hear uh, teachings of love because it means that love is sacrificial. Hmm? I have to give up my comfort to please you. Times I, I might love some particular thing but I need to give that up if, if it helps you. If you're in a situation where you need to be comforted and encouraged I need to be there for you and whatever it takes to, to get you encouraged and comforted, I need to be willing to give up myself to you. This is the church. No other place in the planet like the church. No other place on the planet where people can love with that kind of love like the church. Two Sunday mornings in a row, I was coming up my street, and there's a church at the corner. When I come to the end of my street, West Dixie is going north and south, and there's a church right on the corner on my right hand side. Our brother driving his family to church, and he turns and he comes around behind me. And it's beeping for me to move. So it take him two minutes less to get in the church parking lot. And cars are going down north on West Dixie. And if I move, I move right into ongoing traffic. But he's beeping. Is that the love of Christ? Same thing happened to me this morning. I came to the end of the street. And a guy stood up and struck wood in the parking lot of the church. And he's pointing that he has to get behind me to get into his parking, to get into the church parking lot, but traffic is going north on West Dixie and I can't move. And if I move, then you guys will be planning my funeral service. Is that the love of Christ? You know, I think I take it all. I get ticked off because too often as Christians we say one thing out of one side of our mouth and we do something else. I'm tired of the games that we play. Loving one another with the love of Christ is serious business. We got to be passionate about one another. We got to be intensely devoted to one another. If that's the way we feel about Christ, that's the way we ought to feel about one another. Got to be there for each other. Thank you.
beauty. And brother, sister, going through something. You know, sometimes they say, "Oh, uh, brother, so how you doing?" Uh, you know, I'm not feeling so good. Oh. Uh, I was talking about one day, and I was really going through a hard time. Cancer was killing me. And it was killing me because I was in an environment where the anointing of God was stifled on me. And when you're in this type of environment when you when you step away from the anointing diseases attach themselves to you and that's the time I four o'clock in the morning I end up in North Shore Hospital and I have a cap in stuck in me I'm very focused in in the swimming pool, and I know when I'm attacked, and I run to the bathroom, and that happened. And I had to drive from Betty Ferguson all the way to North Shore Hospital, and it seemed like it's taking two hours, it's probably about 15 minutes. So I began to share with a brother, you know, there's some things that's not, it's not helping me, and he said, uh, Brother, I really don't need to hear about your problems. I was out there in the world. And I have never experienced rage like I've had an experience in church. Because what I'm, what I'm being given is not the love of Christ, and it's killing me slowly. Because cancer has is created an open door for cancer to come in and kill me. Can I be honest with you? I haven't found much of the love of Christ in church. Folk don't know when they keep attacking you. They have no idea what it's doing to you mentally and emotionally. I gotta be honest. I can't reconcile some of the things that we do in church that call the love. I can't reconcile it. Is seem to operate in a gift. You don't know how many hours a night God keep them up praying. You don't know. You don't know what God does to make people who they are. You don't know. But here's what it is: instead of attacking them, ask them. Well, brother, you know, I, you know, I, I noticed that you know this, this, you got an anointing on you. What, what, what it is you do? 
Why did he do it? Because that was what Brother Vishnu used to do. He said, you know, Brother, I, I, I'm learning from you. Don't, don't kill me. And then, let me be honest with you folks. There's times that God had to come and rescue me from Christian people. Sometimes you got to tell the truth. We got to love like Jesus loved. Philippians chapter 2 says we got to put each other's needs ahead of our own. We live in a culture that is very selfish. We live in a culture that says it's about me. And sadly, that same culture is in the church. You probably never asked me to come back in this pulpit again, but that's okay. It's in the church, that selfish, self-centered attitude where it's about all about me. When it's got to be, it's all about us and how we come together. People wonder why, one of the reasons why the church in the book of Acts was so powerful, it was powerful because those brethren, when they got filled with the Holy Spirit, they were also filled with the spirit of love and they came together. And God used them mightily because they came together. That's the kind of love that we ought to be demonstrating one for another. We have our own little group that we hang with and we ignore everybody else. Hmm? Especially they don't look like us. They don't talk like us. That's not the love of Christ, folks. The love of Christ means that we need to be and sisters have my back. And I have their back as well too. That they know when there's something going on that Pastor Sam will come running to. And I know that for them. And I'm going to miss Brother Mishnah because he was always there for me. And me for him. So as we upon the Lord's Supper what we what we what we have today. Think about the price that Jesus paid for our redemption. And he did for no other reason because he loves us so. earth we are. And 
when they want to have an understanding of what the love of Christ is, they're supposed to look at us and they're supposed to see it in us. How we there for each other. How we enjoy each other. How we can come together and we can embrace one another and we can laugh and we can be, we can be joyful with one another. This world is in a very sad place, folks. Huh? They need something to encourage them. And we are it. We are the model that Christ decides, desires to use so that the world will know when they come to him what to expect when they see his love in us. And that's the thought that the Holy Spirit allowed me to share with you today. Because when we come together and we hold hands together and we walk in love, the Spirit of God can come in this place and it can turn this place around. Because there's a community out here that needs to see the love of Christ demonstrated in and through us. Let us stand, please. Father, we thank you for the joy of eternal life. We thank you, Father, that thank God salvation comes to all who would accept it. And so, Lord my God, we also pray today for those who are here that when we leave this place, we meditate upon what your Holy Spirit would speak to us so that their God will look to you to shape and mold us to become more and more like Christ because the world needs to see Christ in us. And so, Lord, we give thanks, we give glory and honor and praise for this moment that you allowed us, thank God, to be a part of this fellowship. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with us now and forever. Did you, did you understand the message?